Come on, give him praise. Worship his holy name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I bless you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have declared. So, Lord God Almighty, we open this place up for conversation. We want to have a dear, core dear, communication with you right now lord we want you to take control of all tongues here today so that we can share together with one another and be well fed in your presence as we discuss your word please lord go ahead and feed us feed us with precious food that forevermore we will never forget thank you father Jesus' name, we've all declared. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, you here with me today? Amen. All yes, right. Sir. So, right, like we're going to start right now with our will. Uh, we know we we'll know the rule. Uh, this is um, ask the pastor, but he's still under the uh, speak up uh, hour that we normally do on Sunday. So, we need to roll the wheel. Whoever's a portion to read the question this time, we read the questions. We all know the rule, and then uh, we will allow one person to contribute in just thirty seconds to one minute or less, and then uh, then I will come up and round up. So we want contribution from the congregation this time around, a little bit different from Wednesday. Praise the Lord. So we believe that Hallelujah. we use this moment to inspire our mind ready for prayer when the time of prayer comes after the praise and worship immediately after this. Praise the Lord. Are you all here together? Hallelujah. Now we can start rolling the wheel. Yes, Let's start it. Let's start off right away. All right. First question is question number six. Question number six. The Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. What happens to pastors who abuse their power, their anointing and touch or harm the children of God? The Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. Um, what happens to pastors who abuse that their anointing and do harm to the children of god any contributions all right so if there's no contribution i think i need to go straight to the point and we'll look at this a uh, little bit we can't explain all today but little what we can get we'll get it all right okay number one about the anointing is that anointing is given by god for god's own intention for god's own purpose so the anointing is not given for the intention of the one who receives it so we don't use the anointing the anointing uses us so anything that has to do with uh us using the anointing then it's an abuse so anything that has to do with we thinking that the anointing given to us is for our own intention is an abuse so the anointing is given for god's own intention for god's own purpose so um uh you said in the question the bible says touch not my anointed do my prophet no um okay when god says that it means that well i am the one that gave the anointing for my own purpose so if i'm delegating somebody to on my behalf and empower him to carry out a task you can oppose him if you do so you will be kicking against me as the lord told uh, paul uh, saw before he was converted to, to paul he was met in the way to damascus and god confronted him and said why do you persecute me okay he didn't say why do you persecute my disciples why do you persecute me that means that god is taking a personal 
God appointed the disciples and anointed them to carry out uh, his work, his mission. Here, here was uh, Saul, who was later opposed to Paul, went against them, was I mean, persecuting them. And then God has to confront, uh, Jesus himself has to confront him. Okay, so, yes, that's true. Now, we say what happens to pastors who abuse the anointing and touch uh, harm their members now listen carefully the anointing is not only given to the called the anointing can also be given we have what we call two called type of calling we have the vertical calling and the horizontal calling every christian is horizontally called you look at you can see that in the book of matthew uh if i'm right matthew 18 it is clear that go ye unto the world and preach the gospel so go ye we are called to go out and preach the gospel so god is indebted to uh following up, uh, following up us up with his anointing with his power so every christian is entitled to be what to be anointed if you crave him for it, if you cry for it if you call upon god for it to carry out his assignment yes now it should not be just that uh, we're thinking that only a pastor is anointed that's completely wrong now listen carefully the only demarcation line here is a thin line is the office for which uh somebody is called on to i call it i call that vertical calling that's no longer horizontal horizontal for all christians that's this vertical calling god is calling somebody vertically god called the entire israel as his children that's horizontal call god called moses vertically to lead god's people that's vertical call so in a vertical call god is also giving a special anointing for that office that special anointing too the same rule applies the one who is given the anointing cannot abuse it cannot use it for his own purpose cannot use it for his own intention it has to be used for god's intention now here is the collision when the man of god rise up and begin to use the anointing against the church member on his own purpose on his own consumption god himself will rise now let me give you the example we saw the example when uh moses got angry against god's people he called them stiff necked so god was not happy about that we saw that scenario okay we saw the situations that uh, that uh, that uh, god and the moses uh, were, were together in this uh, kind of case so um god is the one who is the judge there when it could be a pastor it could be a church member when you abuse the anointing given to you to go against the pastor because you are highly anointed as a church member and you begin to criticize the pastor you begin to divide the church you begin to gather people to yourself because you think you are also anointed too remember those guys that thought they anointed they were competing against moses we remember what happened if i'm right it's not it's not a cora datum and abraham okay they were a competitor against moses so the same way too when a man of god just stood uh abusing his anointing against such people too god has a way of dealing with such man of god so that one it is a uh, god responsibility okay bible says vengeance is of god don't take vengeance for yourself if anybody take advantage of you god will deal with the person personally by himself because god is the owner of the anointing god is the one being fought god is the one being attacked god knows how to take care of it so that when you abuse the anointing the anointing might be taken away from you now listen carefully the gift of god is without repentance but the anointing can be taken away without taking away the gift when you operate on the gift without the anointing it becomes dead you just operating on the gifting but the anointing is not there anointing the gifting to be able to impart life and profit the kingdom so it's just a mere yelling and talking and doing things but the profit for the kingdom is not coming because the anointing has been removed it's only the gifting that is there we need to be careful is that clear enough if you want to look at the book of numbers chapter 20 verse 11 to 12 you can confirm that from there judges chapter 16 verse 18 to 20 you can confirm that from there and galatians chapter 6 verse 17 you can also confirm that uh, there, uh from there 
but, but because of time, we're just going to not read that. We move, we move on to the next uh, question. Question number 19. Reading. The question says, am I allowed to judge others? What should I do when I see things that are not ethically or scripturally right? So we are free to contribute to that. Am I allowed to judge others? What should I do when I see things that are not ethically or scripturally right? right um ooh, i have i have a contribution go ahead um no i think by biblically the bible says no in matthew 7 verse 1 it says judge not that you be not judged for with what judgment you judge you shall be judged and with what measure you measure um it shall be measured to you again um so I think that the Bible calls us to love and not to judge. Um, yeah, it's right there in the scriptures. So I would like to contribute. Oh, okay. Second contribution. Go ahead. It's okay. You're allowed. So um, I believe that we are not allowed to judge, but there is a spirit of judgment that the Lord can place upon a person to set things right. Uh, so when that spirit of judgment comes upon a person, the person can't but declare the judgment of God. There is somewhere in the book of Psalms, one of the Psalms that was written by Asaph, he said, when I'm called to the council to judge, I judge with the right judgment. So when the Lord places his spirit upon you, you can judge rightly. Jesus, Bible says that, he, Jesus himself said, I do not judge of my own. But you see in him, he said that the witcher matters of the Lord is doing judgment and setting at liberty them that are oppressed. So there is a right judgment that the Lord can place upon a person to judge. But if judgment is in the respect of seeing things that are wrong with people and then trying to correct it, then the Bible says that you should focus on yourself also, that you should take out the log of wood on your own eyes before you try to take out the little one in another person's eyes. So there is a spirit of judgment that permits judgment. Great contribution. Thank you, well, Sister Toby and Brother Daniel. I was so heartwarming. Hallelujah. All right. So, wow. There's a portion in the scripture, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So that's it, that's the spirit. So when we're trying to uh, look at somebody who has trespassed or that have done something wrong and we've observed that this is really really not okay as a christian i think it's right to approach the person in the spirit of wanting to support rather wanting to put the person on the spot or wanting to put the person down that wouldn't be helpful that is like helping the flesh to glorify itself over the person so the spirit for which we have to approach the person, we have to be that way. This person need to be restored as my brother, as my sister. I need to support him at this very difficult moment, not to raise further judgment. Affliction cannot come a second time. Already he has sinned, and there is uh, the wages of sin is death. We already know that God punishes sin. It's going to no matter what sin a, a man commit, God is still going to discipline the person. No matter who you are, so as, a, as a father to son, he said, whoever the father loves, he chastises. So God is still going to discipline the person personally. Now for you to now come and judge the person again, that's double judgment. And they also remember that the church also is giving room to, if somebody is a committed member, a church, a responsible minister, and they fall into serious uh, uh, temptation, we are told to uh, not to destroy the person but to separate the person from the office he is occupying so that it can serve for as a lesson for others and then people will not think that this is a freelance 
for anybody to do anything, whatever, uh, whatever he likes or he or she likes in the church. So the person will be separated for, for a while and be washed. Okay, there's a portion of the scripture that says deliver into the hand of the devil, right? But it's not as if you are actually delivering him to the devil. The devil is like you're freeing him for that office so that he can be sober. And then afterward, when we see the change, then we can say, okay, after a while, restore the person the position. So, but the spirit should be what this Galatians chapter one, chapter six, verse one says, in the spirit of not wanting to pull somebody down, okay, to judge. The, the, the word judge is very powerful. I would say, judge not, so that you be not judged. In the book of Matthew, that's one of the uh, first ministration of Jesus when he was going around ministering. Judge not. See, if you don't want the weight of judgment on you, we gotta stop judging people. Okay, he that gives grace, we have grace. So forgive them as uh, forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. If we don't have a forgiveness in our heart, then it can be very difficult for God Himself to forgive us. We need to be generous in forgiveness, releasing people from our hearts so that God Himself, when we make mistake, it can also release us so easily. And our discipline will not be too much for us to bear. Would this make sense to us today? Uh, we can also look at the yes, book of sir. Galatians 5, verse 13. I think briefly we don't have enormous time to be able to expand shit all this. But I think this is the main point here. It's just been mentioned here. I think we are satisfied. Right? Yes, sir. Respond, please. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. let's go to the next question. How do I attain spiritual discernment? How do I separate emotions and workings of the spirit? How do I know the things of God and the things that are not God? Hmm. Uh -huh. Anybody want to contribute? Go. Brother Johnson, go ahead, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, so, so I guess the question is how to um, have discernment, you know, to separate like where um, emotions from actual spiritual activity, because I kind of understand. For example, like someone can be singing a song and you don't know if it's the Holy Spirit you're feeling or if it's just the, you know, the emotion of the keyboardist, the thing of the keyboardist you're feeling. So and it's actually as Christians, we have to have discernment. Discernment is very, very necessary because in the last days, which you are wearing right now, many people will rise up and many things will rise up. And you need to do discernment to, to say this is God and this is not God. And I believe um, how God has built my discernment personally is by knowing God more, basically. For example, if um, you know your mother more than I know your mother, and you can discern what your mother would say. Imagine your mother texts you, texts you something, like you'll be like, that's not mom. Like you can already discern that uh, my mom won't tell me to do this. My mom won't ask me to do this. Because you've been that close. But um, I don't know how many of you know me so well. But some of you might know me. Some of you might not know me very, very much. And there's something that I will text. Some of you might pick it up. That Johnson will not text this kind of thing. Johnson will not say this kind of thing. Then what about someone, someone that you've met, you've only been with for a week? You don't really know anything about him. You, you won't be able to discern if when what he can say, what he cannot, what he cannot say. Do you understand? So it's... I, I feel like I believe that it's, it lies in a close relationship with God. That you, when you are so close to Him, that you can tell that this is God. I know Him. It's not my brother, for example. No one can lie to me about my brother. I know my brother more than anybody. Anybody outside my family, I know my brother more than anybody. So as I believe that where we can build discernment is to draw close to God. The only people that the only people that, that get deceived are those that don't know God. Those are only people that don't, don't, don't get deceived, that get deceived, sorry. If you know your God, if you know him personally, you will not get deceived because you know, because it's the same God in your room. It's the same God in other churches. So if someone, that's, what, that's how I never noticed that when someone is preaching the gospel, you connect. And when someone is preaching, you disconnect. Or when someone is singing, you connect. And when someone is singing, you disconnect. It is because you have known him 
personally so you can easily you see that's the guys that's the person i used to meet in my room every time so i i say in conclusion is basically to have a, a close relationship with god and it is very important for us to develop this thing right now because we need we need it now more than ever praise god hallelujah that 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 yeah. hallelujah that is amazing that's amazing illustration there i love that hallelujah i love that see you can know the the voice of your father you can know the voice of your of your mom okay because both of you are close right and even jesus himself was explaining uh he said the sheep know me and i know them he knows the sheep and the sheep know him he said they will not listen to the voice of stranger he said they will not adhere to the conversation uh to the voice of the one that come through the uh, through the <laughs> through the window but the, sh the shepherd come through the door the, uh, the right path so the, the the sheep know where the shepherd will come through so it is it's, you can look at that carefully it, it's a matter of relationship they know the, the shepherd can't jump the fence it goes through the right door so if i see anybody jumping the fence they say that must be a thief so that's how it is so by getting closer to god now i will say this that is a gift of distinguishing between spirits okay that's a that's a gift but the discernment is not a gift okay let me let me paraphrase that very well discernment is not a gift but there is a gift of distinction between spirits okay now every christian need to have the grace the ability to discern by the virtue of their close relationship with the lord every christian everybody say every christian every christian need to have that discernment in their hearts to be able to know when god is speaking and when god is not speaking all right now how do i separate emotions and walking of the spirit how do how do i know the things of god uh the things that are not of god pretty easy first corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 first corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 but god hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searches all things yes the deep things of god mm. so we can know god we can know god is speaking we can know things are from god because the holy spirit in us every christian who is called a child of god must have the spirit of god and the bible says whoever does not have the spirit of god does not belong to him so the purpose of that spirit is for us to be able to find out the things that are pertains to god now let's look at one portion here it says the book of first john uh chapter 4 verse 1 to chapter 4 I think uh, I don't remember the verse right now. It said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. All right. So, you see what is going on there? So, there are strange spirits. So, what we need to do as a Christian is to try them. How do we try them? We'll try them by engaging the Holy Spirit to help us find out we do not just rationalize and say well i don't need to i don't need to that's what, I, I know i know what is this sometimes you need to connect with the holy spirit to help you interpret what is going on so don't assume you know everything little does our brain know so it is the spirit that searches all things and made those things available to us the bible says jesus himself said the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. It will reveal things to us. That is, that, is, that is his assignment. So we need to give him room to let us know what things that pertain to God and those things that are not pertain to God. And talking about emotion. Talking about emotion is just emotion. Look at it here. Emotion is not bad. But emotion that is ruled by the flesh is going to be an evil passion 
It's going to be a wicked passion. It's going to be ungodly passion. It's going to be a sinful passion. But emotion that is stimulated by the stirring of the Holy Spirit is going to be a very good emotion. God himself, we are told in the Bible, was angry. That's an emotion. So we are assembling God to have emotion. So our emotion must be guided by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That means we don't allow our head to take over our decision making. When our head takes over our decision making, it becomes emotionally empty. We become empty emotionally. We do things anyhow. We make bad decisions. We don't take the right step to do the right thing. But when we simmer down and allow the Holy Spirit in our hearts to inspire the will of our mind, the mind of our, of our heart, which is our will, then we are able to do the right thing, right? And our emotion connected to that, you know, we is guided by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Okay, so I don't want to go too deep on this, but it's just very clear that we can know things that are pertain to God because we have the Spirit of God that will always reveal things to us. So our dependence should be on Him. Galatians 5, verse 16 to 18, I said, then, walk in the Spirit. That is summary of what I was telling you now. Walk. We can have the Holy Spirit and still not be able to walk in the Spirit. Right? You can still have the Holy Spirit, but ignoring when people are ignoring what the Holy Spirit is saying, they go to walk like people in darkness. The Bible says they walk in the vacancy of their mind. That's what the unbeliever walk. They walk in the vacancy of the mind of their spirit. So they are walking in the engagement of the mind of their head. And the leadership from their heart is not in control. And so they are walking in vacancy. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. They, are not guaranteed. they, don't, they don't see hope in the future. They, 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 they freak out with little challenges. That's the way of unbeliever. But the way of Christian, our own is eternal. Our hope is eternal. We don't give up at little thing. We are resilient. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. He said, walk in the Spirit. You shall fulfill the loss of the... You shall not fulfill the loss of the flesh. For the flesh lost against the Spirit. And the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish look at that so that you do not do things that you wish what is the thing that you wish your emotional sentiment your emotional sentiment your 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 head suggestions those distractions that come through your head to do things wrongly that's what you wish so when we as christians we're not just doing what we wish we're doing what we need to do what we ought to do because we are guarded by the Holy Spirit to do it. Hallelujah. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. God bless you. That's it. Let me just summarize it there. So if you want to have to read First John chapter 4, uh, I read that already. Okay, First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 21. You can also uh, look at that. Alright? Praise the Lord. Is there, is there anything to uh, ask at this point? Any question to ask regarding this? Okay, let's go to the next question. And the question is, how does one know the workings of the Holy Spirit in one's life? Wow, good question. I, I think we when we talked about this, we talked about the um, the scripture where it says, "By your by their fruit you shall know them." So I think one way that you know the workings of the Holy Spirit is through like your fruit and like the the things that are happening in your life and around you. Um, I forgot the scripture, but yeah. I think it was Galatians 5. Go ahead, go ahead. I, thought, I think it was Galatians 5.22, all the way down or before then, that talks about uh, the fruit of the Spirit, um, love, joy, perseverance, uh, patience, long-suffering. Um, so just to add to what Toby said, that you can know 
the workings of the spirit by the fruits. Like she said, by your fruits, you shall know them. So there's no other contribution. I believe we can just go to the point. All right. Now let's let let get, let clarify this very interesting question. Philippians chapter two verse thirteen. Philippians two thirteen. It says, "For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure." That's workings of the Spirit. God in you is the Holy Spirit at work. Now, what are these workings? Now, be careful. This is not about gifting. God gives gifts according to his own wish, according to his own will, and to whoever he wants to give it to. So you can't control that. So God is an ultimate controller of who he gives gifts. Now that's that's one part. Then the fruits of the spirits. Okay? It's not the workings. Okay? But this these are what really come out eventually. Okay, the you know that the between your work, your workings, and the product of your workings, right? Does that make sense? So you gotta you gotta understand what is going on here. Now let me categorize it. Working is like a category categorization of what the Holy Ghost does in the in your system, and then before you eventually going to be having the fruit that result. Now let me classify to great about four parts I and mean, the four to five parts. One workings of the holy spirit is to instill holiness or fear of god in you that's workings so you, you are not free even though you are free but your freedom is liberty it's not really freedom so your freedom has a boundary so holy ghost is the one that does that it just, just keep puts you in a barricade it puts you in a, <laughs> in, a in an enclosure that you cannot get out of if you get out of it, go beyond your boundary, it would not be very pleased to see that. So it's the one that instills. You know, people live a life and they don't care about God. They don't fear God at all. I say the fear of God is beginning of wisdom. It's a fool say there's no God. People are there. They call themselves atheists and whatever it is. And they don't even care about God. They don't know. They don't want to fear anything. They do things anyhow. Let me tell you, you as a Christian, you have the fear of God. It can only be achieved, not by your flesh by the holy spirit what make you to rush to the god's presence when you have trouble ah uh, all those things that make you to come to church okay now number two teaching all things and strengthening okay strengthening mind memory okay now if you look at the book of john chapter 14 verse 26 jesus himself told, told us about the working of the holy spirit he said when the comforter comes he said he will teach us all things he didn't talk about the fruit right be careful that's not the fruit he said he will teach us all things it is in the teaching and in the learning of all things that is revealing to us that the products of fruit start coming okay when we listen to his teachings then the result comes begin to bear fruits all right so the teaching of the holy spirit is revelation of god's word Helping us to understand the scripture as we hold the scripture. Without the teaching of the Holy Ghost, the old the oldest scripture become ordinary letter, empty, no impartation. That's what it is. Number three, the workings of the Holy Spirit is to direct direct our path rightly and, and guiding us into truth. So that's workings of the Holy Spirit. Said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your way, acknowledge Him. He shall direct your paths. And it was also confirmed that confirmed also in the book of John chapter chapter sixteen verse thirteen when he make mention of guiding us into truth. All right. So the Holy Ghost workings, God's working in His in His children, is to guide us into truth guide our path rightly number four now the number four i think i, think I slightly mentioned it earlier is the revealings see knowing things is, is different from the gift of knowledge hey listen to me because all christians need to be knowing i will talk about 
discernment recently, right? Kind of close to that. But not all Christians are gifted in the gift of word of knowledge. But all of us as Christians, because you have the Holy Spirit, because of the workings of the Holy Spirit, will be knowing things. So knowing things is part of the work that was assigned to the Holy Ghost to be able to work in us. That is revealing, revelation. Okay? So the Holy Ghost reveal all things. The Holy Ghost searches all things, yea, the deep things of God, and make those things available to us. That's revealing. That's his workings. Is that clear? Then number five, comforting. Praise the Lord. Jesus was very careful about that. He mentioned that emphatically. He said, when the comforter shall come. Why did he call him comforter? That is just because he's going to comfort us. We are going to face challenges. He said, behold, in this world we shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Uh, we have overcome the world. That's what the scripture says. And then that is the need for comforter. When we have challenges. How can a child of God be depressed? When the comforter is there. So I can't comprehend that. See, I just want to live my life with this, by the scripture. I cannot comprehend having the Holy Spirit as a comforter and at the same time having depression. I, I believe the cure, the right medicine for depression is the comforter. Hallelujah. Do you agree with me? If you agree with me, unmute your mic and say yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. The Holy Spirit yes, is the medicine to depression. It's the medicine to loneliness. It's the medicine to when everybody forsake you. It comes to your rescue. It speaks to you. It makes you feel like there's a lot of no, innumerable crowd around you. Just like God was fighting for Elijah. And he had to open the eyes of that guy. He said, open. May God open his eyes and see the host of everyone around us. He didn't know. So he was able to see that the host of everyone surrounding them, protecting them. That is the power of the Holy Spirit, my friend. That's what it is. Hallelujah. John chapter 14, verse 26 will support the teachings of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6 support the direction, direction of our paths. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 to 12 support revelation, knowing things. And then comforting is also uh, uh, stated in book of John chapter 14, verse 16. And then John chapter 15, verse 26 says, But when the comforter has come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, it shall testify of me. Hallelujah. And lastly, the another working of the Holy Spirit is testification. Holy Ghost testify within our heart that we are sons of God. That we are going to get to heaven. These are the workings of the Holy Spirit. Is that clear? Is there anyone having to, having question on this? You can go ahead. God bless you. Otherwise, we move to the next question. Because of time. Thank you, Father. I feel God's presence right now here. Hallelujah. Let's take advantage of that. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah 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 when we testify about his power he moves we are going to ask the lord god almighty to empower us to empower us our future to empower our future right now and make us great giants breaking through breaking forth in whatever we do having success all round about giving us investment on the service of the earth establishing us spreading our wings all over the place give him give him give him give him praise hallelujah lord thank you father thank you lord jesus thank you glory to your holy name for your presence here father you enjoy rock us up to pick us up at a yaga ba sekete proko shaka pakataya rekete proko shupo kubia hala kaza thank you father we praise your name we praise your name thank you for inviting yourself here personally thank you for mixing with us in this conversation we give you all the praise, glory in jesus name we have declared next question god bless you
14. How can I be sure that I'm going to heaven? How can I be sure that how do you know you are going to make heaven right now? If Christ comes now, do you have something that you know for sure you go, we're going to make it with him? How's your heart beating right now? I'm sorry. <laughs> How's your heart beating? <laughs> if Christ comes today, are we sure we are going to make heaven? What's the assurance? What is the assurance? Okay. So there, are, so um, there are two things. So the f the first thing is that um, the Bible, you know, it says, "For God so loved the world, right, and He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life." So whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God, that is the criteria criteria to for making heaven. And the Bible, also, Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can get to the Father except through me. And so there is also another verse that's, that talks about the wages of sin being death. So you can't be in sin and expect to make heaven. Um, there is that, and there is also, there's, you know, there's believing in Jesus. Yes, and that's the criteria for heaven. But you can't be, in, you can't also be in sin. You can't believe in Jesus and be in sin. And expect to make him. Amen. A contribution. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, I want to say something. Um, what Tony said. Um, very, very about vital. You can't believe in Jesus and, and still in sin. It's almost like saying that um, I believe in I believe in the calling of of God on your life, Pastor. And what do I believe in the calling of God on your life? I'll sabotage your ministry. I will <laughs> chase away your members. <laughs> I would, I'll be, I'll be hacking, hacking into your Zoom account, your Zoom <laughs> listing meetings. So you see, I, I'm, I believe in the ministry, in your ministry, but um, terrorizing you is not possible. Those two things cannot be possible. Now, the, the truth is this. When people say that they believe in God, but still, well, it, it happens sometimes because people struggle with sin, but when you're still purposely sinning, that's different because you can believe that there is a God Hmm. But you have not believed in Jesus Christ. You have not believed in what he did, what he fought for. Because you believe in what he fought for, yeah. that he fought for your salvation, yeah. that you will not be slaves to sin. Yeah. It is very, very contradicting to now sin. Hmm. It's not possible. You can't you can't believe in like um that your brother will be a footballer and hmm. yet you're not encouraging him. You're saying you would fail, you will have a fatal injury, something like that. Hmm. So those two things hang, hold hang, hold they go the wrong go hand in hand you have to believe in god believe in jesus and what he died for and this um paul said that if that shall we send that grace my abound he said no because if you do that it means that the very purpose that jesus came to die is a waste it is it is now it's rubbish so we have to believe in what he died for and then follow it because we believe it. we don't just because jesus is not just a person jesus is the logos, every word that is spoken out of God's mouth, that is Jesus. The, the, the being was the word, and the word was God, yeah. and that word became flesh. So that is what Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, great contributions, sirs. Great contributions. Um, that is a portion in the scripture here. Let me just put that as uh, just to support what we have said. All right, it's in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21. So not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, we enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Okay. The question here is the will of God. The testimony that we are going to get to heaven is that we are doing the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. And that was why the Pope, that was why the Holy Spirit was sent after jesus was taken to the father to the earth to the earth to baptize us and guide us into truth which is the will of the father on the earth to be done from heaven all right so doing the will of god is what takes us to heaven 
uh being born again yes if you don't get born again you are not going to be able to receive the holy spirit as if you be born of water and of the spirit you cannot get to the kingdom of god so the first thing first to step in into knowing god's will is to be born of the word of god which is the water and then you come in confess your sin if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that christ is raised from the dead you'll be saved and then you are baptized of the holy ghost and god told the disciples to stay in the upper room until the endowment from above come on them it was you know that peter was not able to stand in trials in challenge when he saw too much too much issue too much attack he was overwhelmed in fact to the extent of actually disconfessing jesus denied jesus in the open but when the holy ghost came the holy ghost gave him the power the confidence to stand for christ to speak fearlessly speak confidently the day of pentecost you know how many number of souls that were saved at once thousands were saved now this is the working of the holy spirit in the life of god's children so to be born of of the spirit is the first thing the born again is the first thing before we can attain even to knowing the will of the father in heaven to be accomplished on earth so that we can now begin to do it so can you, can you see what i'm saying right now so we we are not baptized of the holy ghost we are not qualified to get to heaven so it said as men that are led by the spirits they are the sons of god the book of romans chapter 8 verse 16 the spirit itself also says that roman 8 chapter uh, roman 8 16 says the spirit itself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of god children of god are the people who are doing the will of god that god is able to correct when they are wrong right when they go against his will he correct them by disciplining them and they repent they come back and they keep doing the will of god listener to god doer of god's will okay serving of god's will worshiping of god's will say god look for worshiper who must worship him in spirit and truth in the book of john chapter 4 verse 24 so god is looking for worshiper so whoever want to make a he make heaven has to go through all this process it's not a routine of the flesh or routine of religion it is just what it is the holy ghost need to get into you will reveal the will of god to you and to be able to carry out the will you know what is right you know when you are in a congregation that's a wrong congregation you just know this is not the right place for me to stay because i cannot seem to see the will of god being done here and then you move to the right place where you'll be equipped and grow thereby in world of truth and then when christ comes it takes you to himself how can i be sure that i'm going to heaven finally is to have the Holy Ghost bearing witness in your heart daily that you are a child of God. Simple. Is that clear? Sasa Mans. Right. Oh, you need you have a question for that? Please go ahead. Yeah. I I said, could you explain the last sentence where you said um the Holy Ghost bear with his witness in your heart that you are a child of God? Yeah, that's what is in the Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit is said, bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. That's what the Bible says. Okay, what does that mean? Uh -huh. Now, there's a portion in the scripture that says, the, you know, there is a crying, Abba Father, right? So, this crying, Abba Father, you pray and you have a whisper in your heart. You stay in your room. You, you see, it's, it's not what can be taught by a human being it is what you are going to personally experience it is not two plus two equal to four <laughs> if any man is teaching you that is teaching you oh look 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 this is the way the Holy Ghost is going to speak no 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 that's not that's no teaching like that there is no teaching like that this that jesus himself said he said he said he said my sheep know my voice i know my sheep my sheep know my voice Ha! Ah, i know my sheep my sheep know my voice god voice is not scarce only religion tells us that voice god is too hard to hear those who want to make uh, this a doctrine for themselves they will tell you that 
you have to fast 30 days before you can hear God. They want to make a gain of you. They want to collect your money. That's what they are telling you. <laughs> so, 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 so don't let people make gain of you by telling you that you are not entitled as a church member to hear God. Completely wrong. God speaks to his children and by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God bears witness with you that you belong to God. Praise the Lord. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Any other question? Next. Let's spend more time on this question, man. Number seven. Number seven. The question says, as a believer, what should be your stance as you go through hard times? Oh. Oh, oh, oh. I want to contribute to that. Anybody? Um go ahead. I guess I would um I would say to our stance should be to continue to re rely on God and um continue to just pray and because um basically uh like last what you were saying last sunday on how like god is our rock and basically he's like the source so we should rely on him to get us through the hard times and because also we all know that we're going to go through hard times trials and tribulations like what you said like fear not so our st stance should be like not get scared and not get worried. Um, we should just continue to be highly spirit and continue to have faith, basically having faith and relying on God. Amen. Amen. Any other person? As a believer, what should we should be your stance as you go through hard times? Any other contribution? All right, if there's no contribution, maybe a question will arise when I contribute. All right, let's get into it. As a believer, what should be your stance? Stance. Look at the word stance there. Okay. All right, what should be consistent about you? Okay. What, you, what should you be known, uh, known of in our time? You know, the our time is a test of character actually you cannot get wine out of grape grapefruit except you go through some processing and the processing you're going to press the grapefruit and then let the juice stay for some time to ferment before you can get wine so also you can get uh raw, I mean, rich gold you know that is not uh it's not corruptible in time of corroding for years after you have taking the pig pig gold i'm talking about the raw gold and put it in the furnace and burn it with a high level of fire and then you bring out the pure gold out of it that can stay non corroded for years okay now you can get the best out of a christian god gets the best out of us when he subjects us to some challenges and then we are told not to be afraid of these challenges because uh, David also experienced it. He said, it, uh, it taught my hand to war and my finger to fight. Taught, how did he teach his finger to fight? Uh, God took it to a level of uh, I to fail and so many oppositions going against David, even when he was anointed. Ah, my God. I see, keep asking questions in this area um god allowed persecution to rise after he has been anointed the level of persecution that arose before he was anointed was actually higher than when he was anointed so now the anointing must be for a purpose it is not meant for bed of roses we call it bed of roses 
the anointing is meant to ignite fire that will burn shaft in you out and leave you your remain to be a pure gold all right now listen carefully what john said john the Bible said he said he said his fan is in hand to pour the floor and to gather his weight and all the sheer shaft thereof it will burn with a quenchable fire now that's what he said there unquenchable fire wow that is a fire the holy ghost there is a fire so the work of the holy ghost which said is to cause cause the fear of god to take away all righteousness out of your life now the issue here is this when there is a hard time god allow those hard time to get you to himself with all total attention he knows that when he put our time on you you're going to shift your focus from trusting a man oh my god hallelujah he shift your focus from trusting a man in trusting in yourself in your ability in your skill in your knowledge in your gpa in everything <laughs> and then you'll be running to him and then he can get your full attention let me tell you when a man is very rich and it's not close to god you know who is, who is god is his god is his riches money but when the holy ghost grab a rich man <laughs> and the rich man get born again <laughs> the first thing is going to happen to him it's not that he's going to be lose his money god is going to train him on how to change focus from that money to him and that's what, what christ was testing the rich young man that was told to go and sell all that he has and give to the poor he was angry he was being subject to test there are you able to cope with the holy ghost himself trying to change your focus to me and under your riches we couldn't cope he ran away so hard time tends to give us a reorientation to getting focused more on god so hard times are not meant to destroy us there's no such temptation that are befalling people in the past or test befalling people in the past that is now coming that is so strange that we can't overcome god allowed them to come and he provide the way of escape in the book of corinthians so any christian experiencing little bit of lack now hey my friend it's meant for a purpose do not give up because they are all meant to get you on your feet now listen carefully abraham was given the whole promises that we can think about the promise of the whole world becoming a blessing all his seed becoming a blessing for the whole world hey abraham needed to go through some stuff <laughs> it was delayed he didn't have his own son the son of the promise was not given and when the son of the promise was given god said go and sacrifice the son for me right now what kind of a thing is this so as a christian see god in everything i pray that god will help you to so will give you his eyes as your eyes to see god in everything but that's the only way we can that's the only way we cannot get angry and focus forsake christianity and get disappointed because you are going to see disappointment you see your beloved brothers disappointing you we saw that also in the case of jesus christ when judas iscariot disappointed so look, look you are going to have people who trusted coming up to disappoint you you say oh my god ha ha how can this happen you all, almost want to pack up the faith these are all hard times you should not give up stay where you are get your focus on god Corinthians chapter uh first Corinthians chapter one verse three to four blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ the father of mercies and god of all comfort who comfort us in all tribulations we are going to have it that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which which we ourselves were comforted so god is training you for others not only training you for self he will train you for others so that you can be a good minister you are a witness a living witness of god must be a partaker of what he's saying another way around you cannot preach the gospel without going carrying the gospel ha. hallelujah 
John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in ye, that in me ye might have peace. In the in the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, my friend. Various trials. Why? Why would a Christian go into various trials? Ha. Huh. We have some people to fast, just to fast and pray. They're running away. But we're talking about trials here. Verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work. That you may be what? Perfect and complete. Everybody say complete. Lacking nothing. Complete. Lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. Everybody open your mic up. Lacking nothing. Say that. Lacking nothing. Complete. Lacking nothing. Complete. Lacking nothing. Complete. Lacking nothing. Hush. Complete. Lacking nothing. Complete. Lacking nothing. Complete. Lacking nothing. When you see somebody come up in the future after five years time and they begin to speak like an oracle, these are the reason. He has gone through some fire. It's gone through some hard time. So what he's saying is not just reading Bible and talking. He is talking from the level of training that the Holy Ghost has given to him that no man can ever explain. He said, what the eyes have never seen. The eyes have never seen. The hair that never perceived. Have never gone through the heart of man. He said, what he has for us. That's what he's giving during training. He gives all those things ready that nobody else can ever get. He give it to you. He said, whoever believes in him, said, out of him shall flow the river of living water. So when God begins to dig a well inside you, during training, tribulations, hard time, it's for a purpose to comfort others. More questions. More questions. Anybody have a question on that? Or you have anything to say? Otherwise, we'll um, move to the next question. I just have a I just have a quick quick question Quiet, so sir. like if someone if somebody's like going through a hard time right and let's say like they begin to question god like does that like kind of put them in a like a worse predicament or like like how how does that work hallelujah good question sir brother randy now here it is job went through tough time it was almost compelled by the attitude of his wife and friends to look at God and curse God. But Job refused to curse God, to challenge God, to blame God. That is serious commitment to God. And as the word that says, I believe it's from the mouth of the same Job. He said, even though, although he slays me, I will trust him. Everybody say, although he slays me, I will trust him. I will trust him. That's the word of desperation that God is expecting from his children. Now, look at, again, I'm going to get another, another example. Shadrach, Meshach, Abed, Negro, they were in the lake of the furnace right they refuse to bow down to the idol of the land and they said even if god that we are we are we are taking our stance on even if he refuses to save us at this point we are not going to bow down to this your idol they threw them to the fire god was provoked from heaven he sent the for the very first time after david he sent his begotten son that was supposed to come in the new testament he sent it earlier to come and rescue them. That's what I'm talking about. That is what we are talking about here. Hallelujah. So, but Randy, mm -hmm. in essence, what we are saying is that yes, sir. when we Thank go through situation and problem, we've got to stand there on shaking. We are not be we are not to be quick to speak, quick to make judgment, but be quick to pray. Everybody say pray. Now, right. prayer is just, I pray today, I get a cookie tomorrow. Uh, if your prayer is like that, oh man, we got the wrong perspective for prayer. Prayer is an attitude of worship. When you speak to God, God wants to hear the perfume of your mouth going to heaven to him. It's a phrase on him. When you pray, it's a sign of humility. It's a sign of total dependency on God. 
is a sign that you are worshiping God when you pray. When God sees your mouth shaking, he says, oh, 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 I can see. I am enjoying him. I am enjoying him. He is speaking. He is talking to me. Oh, he realized that I am a God. He realized that I can save him. Oh, wow, I love this. God enjoys the prayer of his saint. Could you imagine that the prayer of the saint work in the book of Revelation is being put together in heaven uh, as a perfume of praise to God? Do you know that? Oh my God. So be quick to pray. Let God be excited at you calling on him in the time of trouble. And it's just, just give him time. Make sure you give him time. When you cry, you cry. Cry like a baby, but give him time to respond. By the time he responds, you will be overwhelmed. Hallelujah. But he doesn't respond according to your own timetable. He doesn't respond according to your own predetermined way. No. He responds at his own time, in his own way, that you say, whoa! I don't know if it will, it will go through this, through, through this channel. And then you, you, your, your pride will be embarrassed. That's God for you there. Acting, working on your behalf. So a, a Christian need to be learn how to wait, God, wait on God. And in waiting on God in our time is when your patience will be tested. Patience. You see, a man of God was told was praying that God, God give me patience. God give me patience. God give me patience. Please, the spirit of patience. You know what God did to him? To God give him hard time <laughs> to create patience out of him. Wow, the working of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It is the working of the Holy Ghost that brings about fruits. Hallelujah. Fruit don't just come. The workings of the Holy Ghost that brings about fruits. That's why I say holiness is not mechanical process. Holiness is what God does. It's workings. Hallelujah. That's why some people fall and rise and fall and rise and cry to God. Eventually they get to the level. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> when you are a warrior, there will be some falling down yeah, sometimes. Not, not by you, but not by deliberate action, but because you are on the battleground. You fall and then you rise again. The second time the righteous man fall, he rose again. <laughs> you fall and rise again and you keep moving. At a point, you get a stability. When you have a baby at the age of one, a toddler, I mean, am I right? So it's going to be falling down when they want to learn on how to walk. Sometimes you walk, walk a little bit and fall. And not walking, fall. And not walking, fall. If the toad lies afraid of trying out, guess what? In my suspense, is walking for, for another four years. But when the toad that take risk and start falling, when they fall and believe that, it's, that let me try it again. And he's trying again, the toad is when he begins to start walking. So when you want to get into that level, <laughs> There will be some war. There will be some hard time you are going to face. Workings of the Holy Ghost will help you to become men in faith. Different from a baby. You grow. Hallelujah. Stop nagging yourself. Nah. You are in the process of growing up. Stop nagging yourself. Focus on God. It will keep you. It will take you. It will keep you up. Hallelujah. Are you with me this evening? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just feel moved right now. Hallelujah. Amen. Any yeah. other question here? Let's go to the next question. Be the last question today, I guess. And then we are going to go to praise and worship and pray. And that's it. Hallelujah. Are you enjo enjoying yourself? Uh -huh. Right. First Corinthians 14 verse 34 says, a woman should not speak in the church. Why? Who want to contribute? <laughs> Hallelujah. I like this kind of question. You guys, you really went so deep and the bringing question I never saw before, <laughs> even in the Sunday service. That's interesting. You had a productive meeting to bring all these questions that are complicated and deep. That's good. Let's let's break it. Who want to contribute? Yeah, I mean, I I think the role of women in, in the church is very vital. I mean, women there were women who followed Jesus. Um, women like Mary Magdalene, women like Susanna and Johanna that were supporting the work of the ministry. 
this woman was so vital um to to ministry of jesus so i believe women are very vital as far as first Corinthians 14 i will have to read the whole story before <laughs> i could comment on that but it's too picking one verse like that and explain it in that line is too i'll have to read the whole the whole verse to see what's going on in there but i think women's role is very vital <sighs> hallelujah any other contribution brother daniel <laughs> um okay so um i think the subject of uh, this is my my thinking though so i think the subject of first corinthians chapter 14 was about bringing order in in service so the corinthian church was very gifted in the gifts of the holy spirit and they often had clashes prophecies and things happening i perceive that the women spoke a lot in the congregational worship they spoke over their husbands they spoke over authorities they just spoke and in bringing or trying to bring order the apostle was making recommendations as to where a woman should speak from it should be from the point of permission from the body of christ or from the authority over her which can be the body of christ the reference that was made to that scripture was genesis chapter 3 verse 16 hmm. and it was that the serpent came to eve adam received an instruction from god right and the serpent came to eve and eve yeah said something that went beyond the revelational standpoint that god gave to adam hmm. god said that shall not touch that shall not eat of the fruit she said god said we should not eat of it or touch it she extended the standpoint of revelation hmm. the was able to manipulate hmm. and cause the fall of man through that and then god speaking to Adam. so i think the reference that was being made was uh like the, the place of submission in the place of worship. And it was not just that reference that was made specifically to women, but he also went further to recommend that we should submit ourselves one to another. Mm. So it was, mm. I believe, my, my, I believe that it's bring, in bringing order into the house of God, what he was recommending was that women ought to speak when they are under authority. Mm. And that being under authority is that you are submitted to the body of Christ, that you are doing what you ought to do when you are, like I, I believe that the contest was that they were speaking over their husbands and they recommended that if they have so much to speak and so much to teach, let them go home and then let them be taught. Let them talk about them before they can come further. I, I believe it was in the context of the way they were contributing in the church that caused so much disorder that the recommendation was made that they should speak only under permission and it was said that they should not be given permission in that congregation. So that's right. my own opinion. That is the contribution. That's what I want to just end that there. He has expansiated the exact answer. I am done with that. Next question. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Yes, sir. That's the last question now. One more chance. question is is technology the tool through which the antichrist will be made manifest in the last days i.e artificial intelligence <laughs> okay we want to contribute you are all uh undergraduate and graduate so you need to help us out here okay And Bible scholars, the engineers, undergraduate engineers here, and graduate, uh, you know, bring out your ideas in this case and synchronize it with the scripture. And let's see what you have to educate us with uh, right now at this point. This is technology here. Um, praise God. Hallelujah. Um, Probably, I think it's obvious to everybody that um, that the Antichrist would basically will most likely spring from what would advance and ride on the wing of technology as it advances. Um, as tracking gets better, as 
um, you're able to monitor more surveillance, all these things, because um, you talked about a one government um, system. So for you to do that, you can't, it is difficult to govern, uh, let's say, um, New York from here. It is very difficult. But when, if with technology, it's almost possible. It is very possible. The advanced technology, with, for example, um, during the old time when uh, when um, Britain colonized um, Africa, um, like let's say Nigeria, for example, like how the route was different. For you to get permission, you have to wait for like three months for them to send the letter. Hmm. Then they will sail all the way. So it is the ruling was was not swift and everything. This could happen in between those spaces. Right, right. But the Bible tells us that there'll be a one system, one currency, hmm. one um, everything is just going to be in unison. Yes. So no more separation and everything. Book of Daniel chapter 12 verse 4, there was a prophecy made about knowledge increase. Uh, we have a tremendous knowledge increase right now and bringing about this artificial intelligence, computer systems, computer softwares, computer hardwares, uh, internet technologies, the computer technologies, all in the same circle of knowledge increase. And it says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and see the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. Knowledge shall increase. These are the sign of the soon coming event. So it is what it is. It has been prophesied. It's not a mistake. But by God's grace, I'm not going to take a sign of 666. I will have gone with Christ before the sign will start getting distributed in the world. God bless you.